When I was 15, my dad started to take me out drinking with him. Believe it or not, back then, people rarely got carded. Nobody stood by the door checking IDs, and if you look like you might possibly be of age, most places were all too happy to turn a blind eye and serve you. Especially if you were with your father, and he was a charming and seasoned patron who was well known and loved by every barkeep had given him the boot. He was a true bohemian from way back and had an old school down home swinging sensibility when it came to life's pleasures, as well as a natural ability to conjure up or sniff out a good time. Having been raised on his collection of jazz and blues 78s from the 20s and 30s, with a little mom's Mabley thrown in for good measure, I found to my surprise that when the 60s arrived, he readily embraced hippie music and culture as if it were a dream come true in all its naked, mud-covered, free-love splendor. It was as if he couldn't believe his luck. Here was the world he'd been waiting for all his life. Not content to let a little thing like marriage get in the way, he pursued his fancies with the gusto of a convict set free. And when his sh shenanigans finally became too much for my mother to bear, she unceremoniously cut him loose. Now he could put away those painful memories of what he so poignantly referred to as the great pussy drought of the 1950s, and really live. Free of marital constraints, living is exactly what he did. It was the early 70s in New York City, and life was one big fabulous banquet waiting to be tasted, savored, and eagerly devoured. Downtown awaited with its vast carnival of attractions, cheap, unsavory, intriguing, and best of all, open all night. As luck would have it, Dad was more than happy to take me along for the ride. And as we made the rounds, he proudly introduced me to his sprawling retinue of friends, each of whom welcomed me warmly as if I were an old pal. There were rum-soaked rum geezers, aging floozies, struggling musicians and flaming queens, playwrights, sex pots, runaways and trapeze artists, freaks young and old galore. Dad didn't have any provincial notions about who was suitable to hang with. As long as you were down to earth and fun to be with, you were good with him. One by one, we sloshed our way through all the classic watering holes. Whitehorse, Chumleys, McGoverns, Ear Inn, Puffies, Spring Street and Broom Street bars, and of course, Finelli's. As I grew familiar with these people and places, each spot developed its own special appeal but of all the joints he ushered me into, the one that was destined to become truly beloved was Barnabas. Barnabas Rex was a cozy one-time biker bar down on Duane Street, just off West Broadway. When I say cozy, I mean the place was famous for being the tiniest bar anyone had ever seen. But despite its size, the cramped quarters were never an impediment to fun. Instead, the tight squeeze encouraged a convivial intimacy that was further fostered by its trio of bartenders, Ace, Gary, and Peter. The room was just barely big enough for a small pool table that occupied the greater portion of the floor space, and it was worked nightly by the slickest bunch of amateur pros in town. The bar stretched along one side of the room, a row of hooks draped with coats ran along the opposite wall. A gleaming Rockola jukebox under the front window pumped out jam after jam for the bunch of us who'd mastered the trick of dancing our asses off together in a three-foot square space. The compact warmth was only magnified by the fascinating mix of weirdos for whom it was a kind of second home. Indeed, there was no way not to make friends there since it was impossible to avoid rubbing up against everyone in the place at some point during the night. In the dog days, we'd lounge on the big wooden cable spools that were lined up out front. In those parts, there wasn't much of a street parade to take in, but it didn't matter. The air hummed with a creative and sexual potential, and a magnetic lust for life fueled the imagination and drew people together. There was a distinct feeling that anything was possible. I'd quickly developed a taste for black Russians, and though I was a skinny little thing, I could knock him back all night and never really get sloppy. I wasn't a half bad pool player either, once loosened up, and I occasionally impressed the drop-ins who'd never seen me play. One night, a couple of macho types wandered in looking for a game. Bemused at my offer to go against them, they consented, throwing each other a quick smirk as they chalked up. Figuring they'd teach the kid a few things, 
They generously allowed me to break. So I called stripes, racked up, then elegantly lifted the rack. Crouching, I eyeballed the table, then stood up, leaned in, got my feel on, and cracked them hard. Boom, rolling in all directions at lightning speed, five stripies flew straight into pockets, the remaining two settling into fortuitous positions. The whole bar erupted, crowding in to survey the table as I casually threw my slack-jawed op jawed opponents a glance. I admit it was just dumb luck. I wasn't that good. Still, I'll never forget the look on their faces as they quickly rethunk their game plan. Having been properly shamed, we never saw them again. It was around that time that the crowd at Barnabas began to expand in all the wrong directions. The change crept in slowly at first, but eventually settled into an undeniable and unwelcome fact, a fact that none of us cared to admit, let alone verbalize. The dreaded sense that your favorite obscure dive was becoming discovered, fueled an unspoken undertone of panic in the hearts of the regulars and cast a subtle pall over the nightly proceedings. Sadly, we watched as the classic pattern played itself out. Disillusioned old-timers began to drift away, opting for alternate spots on their itinerary. Others branched out in search of unspoiled old-school joints. And all the while, more and more interlopers filled the bar stools and commandeered the pool table, adding a shrill, showy, and overwrought tone to the atmosphere. I finally knew for sure that things were really changing when I stepped outside for air one night, and there, Hovering a few yards away was John Belushi, Ackroyd, towering warily behind him. Drinks in hand, they kept their distance from the folks milling and chatting in front of the bar, pacing in circles as, as if unsure of exactly how to be in the situation. Neither in nor out, they skulked about stiffly, skirting the perimeter of the palpable warmth that emanated from the heart of the bar. It looked to me like they wished for all the world that they were not the wildly popular and universally adored entities that they found themselves to be right then. Cautious, yet drawn to the flame of social interaction, they hesitated, loitering just beyond the circle of inclusion. Of course, this being New York, nobody did much more than throw a quick sidelong glance in their direction just to be sure they were really seeing who they were seeing. No one rushed them for autographs. Nobody had any intention of fawning over them or demeaning themselves with demonstrations of star-struck adulation. After all, every New Yorker considers themselves to be innately worthy of a certain fundamental level of acknowledgement just for being a New Yorker. Respect is given where due, but in a word, we're not generally impressed. So no one stared, no one bothered them, no one even said hello, except my dad, who, instinctively sensing their predicament, kindly provided Belushi an opening through which to enter the circle. A chance to just be another regular guy, if only for a brief moment. Catching his eye, he addressed him in the most casual, natural, and understated way, as if he were a familiar acquaintance. Hey, John. Belushi nodded reflexively, his body locked in apprehension. I couldn't help but wonder right then what kind of Beatlemania-like craziness he must be accustomed to dealing with. With an aura of utter confidence, which failed to mask a devastating shyness, he whispered back a barely audible, Hey. A hint of confusion flashed across his chubby face, face then softened into a sudden wisp, wistful awareness of the nature of my father's gesture. No doubt he must have been asking himself just how it was that he came to be the needful recipient of this peculiar form of charity. Turning, he meandered back to the relative safety of Ackroyd's imposing presence. It was clear they were a kind of anchor for each other. Of course, the glaring irony was that you couldn't have named two guys in the entire country at the time who rated higher on the coolometer. But what good did it do them if they were exiled from the organic stream of life that they clearly still longed to be a part of? For them, the days were over where they could just be two buddies sipping a beer outside a great old dive on a sultry summer night. They existed now in some in-between space, the kind of weird space that the culmination of your wildest dreams leads you to before you know what's happening. Watching from just inside the doorway, the initial thrill I'd felt receded as I slowly came to realize that I actually sort of 
felt sorry for them. Later that night, Ace told us that he'd served them a few times and heard they'd been spotted at several bars around Tribeca. Everyone knew they had their own private space as well, Cody's, a bar they rented over on Hudson Street. Dubbed the Blues Bar, there they could relax amongst others of their station, those who'd also been draped with the barbed mantle of fame. I must admit, at the time it was a kick to share Barney's with the Blues Brothers, but that kick was quickly followed by a worrying thought. If Belushi and Ackroyd had discovered Barnabas, the beautiful people and the tourists couldn't be far behind. Suddenly the writing was on the wall. How much longer would the place be ours? The answer, as it would happen, was not long at all. Indeed, the clientele now began to shift dramatically from grizzled working stiffs, starving artists, pool sharps, and the underground rockers to Wall Streeters, real estate sniffers, and uptown swells looking to slum it down in the wilds of Soho. With an eye to get out while the getting was good, Gary and Ace decided to throw in together and look for a place of their own, and they set their sights on another old bar way down on Greenwich and Warren Streets. Mickey's occupied the ground floor of a standalone building ringed by parking lots, and it sat squarely at the far end of a no man's land. Perched on a corner that was literally the end of the road, it hugged the farthest flung fringe of a dying industrial zone, a se section of town that had yet to be populated by any but a handful of pioneering artists. Mickey's didn't quite have the intimacy and magic of Barnabas, but it possessed all the necessary essentials a pool table, a kick ass jukebox, and an address that was well off the beaten track. Once they'd settled in, our barkeeps drew us there. Most of the old crowd followed along as well, and we were glad for the continuing camaraderie. Despite the change of venue, the presence of the group created an instant feeling of welcome and a sense of coming home again. The place grew on us, and soon it was our new mainstay. Back then, Lower Greenwich Street marked the perimeter of town. There was nothing but open ground between it and the river. Rarely was there any traffic to speak of since there was no place past that point to get to. Taxis never cruised that far over. And aside from the occasional lost tourist, the streets remained empty and windswept. From beneath the derelict bones of the elevated West Side Highway, blocks of grassland swept out towards the water and spread far along its banks. Sitting at the window of the bar, you could stretch your eyes all the way to Jersey. Scanning the patchy fields, a single landmark caught the eye. It was the crumbling shell of a burnt out tenement, its jagged silhouette looming like some spook house on the otherwise serene vista. Down at the edge of nowhere, a frontier otherworldliness suffused the spot with mystery. And with your back to the city, you could almost convince yourself you were not in New York at all. In nice weather, we'd drag a few chairs to the curb and lean back, shooting the shit and nursing our beers in the dim sparkle of twilight. As the night wore on, our chatter grew hushed and we gazed out absently, beyond the ragged weeds and past the charred fingers of rotting piers, to where the fine glisten of the Hudson rippled darkly churning as it drifted out to meet the bay. Hypnotized by its potent allure, we'd slip into silence, each of us snug in their own private reverie. Now and then, a gentle breeze floated in off the water, rolling an invisible wave across the fragrant grasses. It smelled just like the country on a summer's night. And then, one day, without warning, it was over. Belushi and Ackroyd had swooped in and bought up the property, turning Mickey's into their own exclusive clubhouse. Word was, they'd both gotten smashed there one night and been cut off at the bar. Within days, they turned around and made their move, acquiring the building and usurping the joint out of sheer spite. With plans to open a club on the spot, Belushi famously OD'd. And needless to say, nothing ever came of it. His widow sold the property soon after. As for us, all we knew was Ace and Gary were out in the cold, and so were we. Mickey's had vanished, just like that, dissolving into memory. So, once again, we picked up and moved on.
sweeping our radar through the dense geometry of the city and sniffing the breeze for the next port of call. <laughs>